Well, thanks very much for being here. Today's talk <clears throat> is based on this article I wrote some years ago, and I wish I had used this title, Why Do Government Officials Believe in the Goodness of Bad Policy? Um, most economists, I think, will agree, surveys indicate, that a lot of our policies are bad policies. And on all these matters, the revisions I would favor would be in the liberal, I mean classical liberal direction. And I kind of come from that point of view in this talk and approaching this whole issue of good and bad policy. I would go further with other policies that surround us, um, which maybe economists don't have as much consensus on. But we all feel that the government is doing a lot of policies that are bad. So it almost doesn't depend on where, how radical your views are or even in which direction. Or at least some of what I'm saying I think could generalize to other points of view. But I am going to uh, assume a kind of classical liberal point of view. Now one answer to this is just sort of cynicism, dishonesty, greed, villainy. Economists might say rent-seeking, capture, that these parties somehow influence government determinations. These policies are supported by them. Somehow policymakers are, are benefited. Politicians are benefited through this process. So that's one possibility. Um, the thing is that when you meet the folks, they don't seem particularly villainous. They might seem quite sincere and even decent, including the people who evidently are just supporting these policies with no obvious vested interest in them. <clears throat> David Hume said that, in, this is a kind of famous quotation of his, in contriving any system of government and fixing the several checks and controls of the Constitution. Every man ought to be supposed a knave and to have no other end than private interest. And he suggested that this was a just political maxim, supposing that the folks would be knaves in government, though at the same time it appears somewhat strange that a maxim should be true in politics, which is false in fact. So what he's saying here is kind of like this observation that when you meet these folks, they don't seem like just crooks laughing all the way to the bank and, and so on. So he himself sees this kind of paradox in trying to uh, understand a constitutional construction. So another broad sort of interpretation then is that they're not evil, just systematically wrong. And this obviously raises the question, well, why do they persist in error? Why aren't they prepared to learn that 2 plus 2 does not equal 5? And broadly speaking, our answer is culture. Um, and that could be extended out to the general you know, political psychology, general public opinion. And that does surround, of course, government agencies and government officials. And we cannot lose sight of it. But it's not actually uh, my focus for today, which is more the internal culture of the government agency or organization. But it does, you know, we do always have to realize that there are these bigger things which could bring us to these big questions about our evolution, our cultural institutions throughout the entire country, and so on. So I'm narrowing it. Why do government officials, particularly in the habitus of their government agencies, their government organizations, believe in the goodness of bad policy? Now there's wrinkles. There, there, we go, I'm going to tell a kind of model almost, but I am aware that wrinkles could be added to that. And one very big one is about political appointments at the top when political appointees are led to lead an organization and might come in with actually quite different beliefs than what the staff and the internal culture thinks. Um, so we got, we're going to have to keep that kind of issue in mind, but it's not going to be my focus and I'll come back to it at the very end. So turning now into the organization, these are the mechanisms I want to talk about um, this one being the one I'm going to dwell on most, but I think we have to first talk about these first two. 
um, think first of all, let's do a thought experiment about you approaching an organization, you going on the job market, the labor market, and you're thinking about a, sending a resume to one of these government agencies. And I want to start with an assumption that you have beliefs that are quite in conflict with the sort of general official beliefs of that organization. Or let's say somehow you land in that organization and you find that you have beliefs very much in conflict with them. So that's the first sort of assumption. <clears throat> what are your options in this case? Well, I think we can broadly speak of five here. One is to depart the community or to never sort of go into it in the first place. A second would be to change the culture of the organization to suit your beliefs. Third, play the cynic by getting on within it, supporting its goals while privately rejecting the culture. Four, remain within the organization but openly voicing a dissenting view. Five, embrace the culture that you're now immersed in. Well, how's that, how are those working out for you? I'd say that all four, these four, it's gonna be not so good. You're not gonna be able to change the culture, however charismatic and persuasive and noble that you are. It's very, very, very uphill battle, to put it mildly. Playing the cynic is possible, but not very personally satisfying. Um, open, uh, voicing open dissent could be uh, feel like a very um, thankless task, and so on. And if your beliefs directly conflict, embracing the culture is not going to be very attractive either. And in this whole process, you got to think about what they feel on the other side and how much they'll tolerate before expelling you. If you try to change the culture, they might figure, sorry, we don't think you fit in here, right? If you play the cynic and they kind of detect that and see that your heart's not really in it, you don't really appreciate what they celebrate and hold sacred, again, they might figure that you don't really belong there. And similarly for opening, uh, voicing open dissent. Um, so, <clears throat> You might, in all those cases, be disliked or face expulsion. And what you see here is that the self-sorting, what you choose to, where you choose to send your resume, as it were, and the screening, their reaction to your resume, as it were, are actually interrelated and form a spiral. So you can't really speak of these two things in separation, anticipating that you won't be liked, or that your chances are slim, you don't send the resume, and so on. So that always has to be kept in mind. <clears throat> and, but the upshot is, remember I listed five, four of them don't, I'm, I'm kind of gonna assume that they're very minor or unlikely, and that therefore the fifth, the most likely, is departing the organization. That means you don't have somebody who you know, has viewpoint diversity, belonging, right? Now, on these matters, I want to read you this quotation from Hayek. And this quotation actually continues, if you look at your handout, for three more slides. So I want to warn you. But I think it's worth it because it's very timely still. I don't want to dwell on its applications today. Also, it shows the richness of this great work that really does merit rereading. He says, the organizations that we have created in the fields of labor, agriculture, housing, education, and so on, have grown so complex that it takes more or less the whole of a person's time to master them. The institutional expert is frequently the only one who understands the institution's organization fully and who therefore is indispensable. Almost invariably, this new kind of expert has one distinguishing characteristic. He is unhesitatingly in favor of the institutions on which he is expert. This is so not merely because only one who approves of the aims of the institution will have the interest and the patience to master the details, but even more because such an effort would hardly be worth the while of anybody else. The views of anybody who is not prepared to accept the principles of the existing institutions are not likely to be taken seriously and will carry no weight. 
As a result of this development, in more and more fields of policy, nearly all the recognized experts are, almost by definition, persons who are in favor of the principles underlying the policy. And the politician who, in recommending some further development of current policies, claims that all the experts favor it is often perfectly honest because only those who favor the development have become experts in this institutional sense. And the uncommitted economists or lawyers who oppose are not counted as experts. Once the apparatus is established, its further development will be shaped by what those who have chosen to serve it regard as its needs. So Hayek, we see, was doing sort of organizational cultural theory in his work, and he was actually making that part of the case for liberal policy, for not having all this government intervention, which then calls for all these government agencies, which then have all of these um, kind of pathological cultures. Um, now, I want to turn to this quotation from Thomas Zaz on the drug war. Why do we now lack a right we possessed in the past? Why does the federal government control our access to some of mankind's most ancient and useful agricultural products and the drugs derived from them? These are some of the basic questions not discussed in debates on drugs. Why not? Because admission into the closed circle of officially recognized drug law experts is contingent on sh shunning such rude behavior. Instead, the would-be debater, debater of the drug problem is expected to accept as a premise that it is the duty of the federal government to limit the free trade in drugs. All that can be debated is which drugs and how they are to be controlled. So he's saying something very much like what Hawk was just saying, and I especially wanted to show this quote because, hey, folks, we've seen liberalization. So, you know, my story isn't like, you know, so iron logic, so fatalistic as we might think. For marijuana in particular, we've seen real liberalization. Um, so we can see that the other wrinkles that I'm not dwelling on here do matter. Um, but now, I had started with this thought experiment of you having beliefs directly in conflict. Now I'm going to change the assumption. What if you do not have prior beliefs, okay? you come to the organization uh, without any definite opinions about it. Well, often I say your, your views adapt to the prevailing culture, this kind of group think, right? Here's the group and here's their think. Um, <clears throat> your purposes depend on your situation, including your job, your work life, your career, and individuals would believe ideas or different ideas if their situation were different. Belief structures are plastic, affected by the heat and pressure of everyday experience. Mencken was fascinated by belief plasticity. I have a couple of quotations. I'll read just this one. The influenza epidemic of 1919, though it had an enormous mortality in the United States and was in fact the worst epidemic since the Middle Ages, is seldom mentioned. This was published in 1948, by the way. And most Americans have apparently forgotten it. This is not surprising. The human mind always tries to expunge the intolerable from memory just as it tries to conceal it while current. And here's one on conscription. Here's another one that's kind of amusing, but I'll skip that. Belief plasticity relates to philosophical pragmatism. And in speaking about how we develop ideas and get locked in, he made this analogy. You may alter your house ad libitum, but the ground plan of a first architect persists. You can make great changes, but you cannot change a Gothic church into a Doric temple. Now, I want to pick up on some so social psychology points to elaborate this belief plasticity. Here, I'm drawing on Robert Cialdini's work in particular. And I'm going to talk about these two headings, Truths Are Us, and then Commitment and Self-Consistency. These are a couple of the big principles that he offers as important. Truths are us are the ideas that we get these social cues, and that kind of teaches us how to think in a way and it explains why television producers use canned laughter, why bartenders salt their tip jars with dollar bills, preachers seed their audience with enthusiasts, 
and how hundreds of people can line up in willful fashion to take poison as they did in, and knowingly kill themselves as they did in Jonestown in 1978. And if social proof you know, has such strong effects in these cases, we certainly can believe it does so in you know, duly created, official, powerful, permanent government agencies and authorities. Um, these social psychologists like to use this example of immersion. They talk about the unification church of Sun Myung Moon. Uh, there's four steps. Potential recruits are first contacted individually and invited to come to a two-day weekend workshop. These workshops are then followed by a seven-day workshop and then a 12-day workshop and then membership. And you can understand how in each case the not so enthusiastic, the half-hearted kind of fall away. And then in their new, then the next stage, the person doesn't see the reluctance, the questioning, right? The doubting. And so they get st these reinforcing um, um, social cues, which directs them to membership. Sounds a little bit like the IHS protocol, doesn't it? But that's the point. It kind of goes for all social organizations. All, I mean, that's the way we organize modern, the modern world. It's, it's unavoidable, um, <clears throat> and it certainly pertains to, say, you know, the Department of Agriculture, where you're similarly going to get stages of advancement, immersion, with accompanying taboos and superstitions, if you will. <clears throat> now, the next psych social psychology point is this one, that people fancy themselves wise and consistent beings and that once you take paths, uh, steps down a certain path, you're you know, looking to support that. Uh, we often call this today confirmation bias. Adam Smith said, the opinion which we entertain of our own character, kind of our selfhood, our theory of ourself, depends entirely on our judgments concerning our past conduct. It is so disagreeable to think ill of ourselves that we often pur purposely turn away our view from those circumstances which might render that judgment unfavorable. So once you've started to buy into certain purposes and beliefs and important things, you're unlikely to go back and say, oh, I was an idiot. <clears throat> and so this, think of the rise of an individual to the state medical licensing board. First, that person must be a prominent member of the profession, not too outspoken uh, or daring perhaps in his thinking, would have to find a position in the association and then gain confidence of influential people and eventually get appointed to the licensing board. And there he will experience this group think very likely um, enveloped within a culture Outside viewpoints are kind of cleaved away. Dissenting views are sort of dismissed and disparaged, if only privately. And these are a couple of the famous authors who've talked about groupthink, him particularly in the government. Well, they're both actually very focused on government decision making and government agencies. Um, and it's again, it's all around us, but it's most important for government because it's so much more powerful. It's so much more far reaching as I think we all understand. And let's think for a moment about correction mechanisms here. That is to say, things that would correct defective beliefs. Well, private organizations depend on voluntary support and participation, and that is just all important. Um, I don't want to you know, dwell on it a great deal, but that is just so different than governments relying on coercion First of all, in the taxation, which is a big part of the funding and support of so much of the government sector, creating these huge and highly centric players in our culture, but also the government uses coercion to place restrictions on competitors to their big players, to perhaps restrictions on their opponents and critics, not so much in our country with uh, the First Amendment and everything, but historically and elsewhere, and in subtle ways, I would say actual coercion sometimes can play a role here as well. So the correction mechanisms that we are accustomed to thinking about in this context, and which, which work, I think, pretty well, are just so much worse here. Um, 
Now I want to turn to like a different an a kind of analogy. This kind of recasts some of what I've said, um, but perhaps adds a little bit as well. And that's to think about a technology metaphor, a, the path dependence and lock-in of technological standards and the theory there, now applied to cultural systems, okay? Kind of like almost beliefs as technologies or standards. And so just before we get to beliefs, the, what, what these folks talk about are things like this gauge for a railroad versus this gauge. And the point is, is that once people start laying one gauge, it's path dependent. It creates incentives to continue on that gauge, okay? And similarly for other competitions between standards, QWERTY versus other keyboards and so on. Um, and I wanna follow Paul David's theory as he nicely develops it in one paper in particular. And he generally kind of has this story that the bad system might get locked in, a kind of market failure, and we might need government to get us out of it. Let me mention that as far as technology goes, I think that Stan Leibowitz and, and uh, Stephen Margolis have done a very nice job suggesting that those ideas don't uh, have much purchase uh, or plausibility. In terms, not, not that these effects aren't there, but the people that the this, this system is, gets so locked in or that it's so unfortunate and that people set out on things so blindly. But anyhow, or that the government can do better. But anyway, I want to apply it to culture where I think it really does resonate, particularly the culture of government agencies. So I draw directly on Paul David here. And what he does is he associates three features to this path dependence problem. The first is he calls quasi irreversibility. Like you see these guys laying the track here. Well, you know, if they laid it this way and then you decided, no, it should be this way, the other one, you know, you, you would, a lot of your investment would be irreversible, right? It wouldn't be all of your investment. You'd have the route and you've cleared it and you've graded it, but you would have to lay the track over again. So a lot of the investment would be irreversible or sort of sunk. So that's one of the important features of it. <clears throat> the second is the idea that the value of the standard to you is a function of how much other people are already using that standard. Okay, so that's a kind of technical interrelatedness, sometimes called the network externality or network economies. Um, and so it's good to be in sync with the other, with other people and therefore to be on the standard that they're adopting. Otherwise you might have a train wreck, right? Um, so that's kind of the value to the user. And then there's the cost of bringing new users in. This is another idea of economies of scale, which is that the more that people are doing this, the cheaper the product, the easier it is to learn it. You can ask someone more easily how to, so sort of the cost of using it as opposed to the benefits of the standard. Um, and so these, and the thing is, I think all three of these things relate so, fit so well beliefs. You know, you get invested in your beliefs and your ideas, you get attachments, you get sentiments that build up necessarily to your habits in your beliefs. You know, we live by sentiment. Um, remember, Re Hume is always quoted as saying there's reason and there's sentiment. You got to, or passion, reason and passion, which is a part of, kind of a part of sentiment. Um, but you got to remember, he said that reason is a calm passion. Don't forget that. Um, anyway, the, all three features I, fit, I think fit, especially government, and thus um, we can think about lock-in, right? And this leads us to this following expectation, at least my model here, that they'll exhibit a culture that is quite uniform, inert, and impervious, okay? Now will that, so we, we have the idea that the, it'll be uniform, inert, and impervious. But what will the creed of it be? Maybe since adventitious origins can make such a difference, you know, we can't really predict that. But I think we can. I think we can generalize about that. It won't be random. And here, so some ideas sort of on the genealogy of organizational cultures, looking at origins and incentives. First, incentives. Something I'm calling here the, the self-exaltation principle. Everyone wants more comfort and wealth. 
and almost everyone more recognition, prestige, eminence, power, perhaps. We want a sense of significance, importance. We feel important when we can believe a story in which we get to play the hero. We want to take credit for both the good and the greatness achieved. That's, you know, all part of this selfhood creation. Um, so I suggest that this will lead to the glorification of the agency. Officials uh, find comfort and prestige in their position, and they will come to find legitimacy and importance as well. Um, they like to see the agency's actions as the cause of good achievements for the world and themselves the cause of the agency's actions. And as Jonathan Haidt would say, sacred beliefs, you know, they develop sacred beliefs about who we are, what we're doing, how important it is, and so on. And, you know, I don't, you know, I just think that's the way humans work. I don't, you know, I think we need to have a sense of sacredness to, um, and sort of uh, reverence sometimes. Uh, it's just the way of the world. It's, it's, what, it's the way we are. Um, so I think this self-exaltation is universal enough that we can expect it to um, lead to the pursuit of expanded power for the agency and reluctance to surrender it. And then the second one is the matter of the origin or the founding. Okay, that gives the cultural foothold to certain theories and goals, you know, from the outset. And well, that founding was, for many of these agencies that, like Hayek was referring to, a story about how social affairs needed governmentalization. The founding theory was that liberal arrangements, whether it's free markets or social lodges, social institutions, civil society, private charity, whatever it is, networks, you know, that somehow these were failing or inadequate and government need to be involved, either again with active players funded by taxation or by restrictions and controls or some combination thereof. So liberals are likely to see badness persisting in the cultural systems since those agencies were founded to abridge liberal arrangements. These two principles then, I think, do suggest that the culture within will be kind of pro-governmentalization, generally speaking. Uh, regarding the public school establishment, these guys said in 1990, although traditionally they have tried to portray themselves as non-political experts pursuing the greater good, they are in fact a powerful constellation of special interests dedicated to hierarchical control and the formalization of education. Very hard-hitting statement in this book. <clears throat> so we do have theories, this is now sort of to pull back and wrap up, we do have theories of why bad policy persists, if not why it originally comes, although we have theories for that too. Um, and what I'm suggesting here is a very self-supporting system. You know, no, each of these polls in this frame of the TP, like no one of the polls has its own independent grounding, like stuck deep into the ground, like a pillar, but they are all supporting each other. Okay, and that's, that's sort of the flavor of this, I think, uh, in, in, a, in a very significant way. This Carl Krauss, uh, a, a, a Viennese critic, writing around the time of World War I, said, how is the world ruled and led to war? Diplomats lie to journalists and believe these lies when they see them in print. This is such a lovely statement because it kind of gets to the the eventual kind of sincerity that emerges from this activity. They lie, and then they come to believe the lie. Once the other pole of the pyramid, of, of the TP, has like somehow, in their eyes, validated the statement that started as a lie, right? <clears throat> See, media leak strategy is very old. <laughs> Um, and Mencken likewise said, you know, about these interventionists and people who believe these things, they are not the less quacks when they happen to be quite honest. They might have quite a lot of this sincerity and come across as very sincere, 
but that doesn't mean that they don't sort of believe in a TP fashion, too much in a sort of TP fashion, and hence are quacks. <clears throat> and in the spirit, getting back to these constitutional considerations like the Hume that I started with, let's read Thomas Jefferson, it would be dangerous delusion or a confidence in the men of our choice to silence our fears for the safety of our rights. That confidence is everywhere the parent of despotism. Free government is founded in jealousy and not in confidence. It is jealousy and not confidence which prescribes limited constitutions to bind down those whom we are obliged to trust with power. So is there any hope from this whole story? Um, well, you know, what sustains these bad cultures within these organizations to, to a great extent is insulation from criticism and we might hope that new communications might empower enlightenment. I think that the story of marijuana kind of fits this. Just a lot of criticism, a lot of, and I don't just mean Milton Friedman and Thomas Zaz and intellectuals. I also mean, you know, The Wire and the movie Traffic and just like all of this, like, awareness that actually in that case I think led to the right direction of result. So there's hope, there's some hope like that. Um, and then there's this issue, you know, about, well, gee, what about party politics and elections and, you know, new executives like presidents, governors, mayors coming in to appoint different heads. Like we've got these, oh, I've got this theory of this terrible agency and then, you know, someone might come and put someone very different at the head of it and people are policy, as they say. And so that's a very important wrinkle. And um, you might now have people at the top at odds with the staff. And reform is very different, difficult. Um, there can be great intra-organization conflict, cultural, moral, administrative. This is, I think, really a fascinating thing. Um, I had a student. Uh, who works in the government, write a pretty interesting, doing, write some pretty interesting work that um, we never shared with anybody. <laughs> um, anyway, also let me also add that enlightenment is kind of its own good and the idea of communications helping us to sustain a, a, a sort of wiser and more virtuous subculture is sort of an end in itself. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you.